Welcome to Book Talk, and I am so excited to be able to introduce you to my friend Tuska Lee, not just because she's another Nebraskan, which is actually a real selling point in your favor, Tuska, mm -hmm. um, but you write some amazing books. Would so you want to tell people just a little bit about yourself, and then we'll start talking books? Absolutely. Well, as you mentioned, I live in Nebraska, so I'm talking with you today from south of Fremont, and my husband is a farmer. Just finished. Um, so yeah, my husband's a farmer. We're we're in the midst of a lot of stuff going on at the farm, a lot of things going on with the house. Um, I have book number 12 on the way in May. Uh, I write biblical fiction. I write thrillers. I write some allegory. Um, I've written about uh, Eve, Judas Iscariot, a fallen angel. Um, my most recent two books um, were a pandemic duology that happened right before COVID. So there was that. I'm really excited to uh, move on to my next release after all that, which is a World War II story. So that's a little bit about me. I have four, um, I have four stepchildren. Um, when, when we got married, I married a single father of four, and I have a giant German shepherd who weighs 160 pounds named Timber. So oh, that's more than you weigh. That's more than I weigh. That's yes, cool. he's, he is ginormous and he's more popular than me on my social media. So if you go to my social media, you'll see plenty of him. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, pets really are kind of a doorway into our personality. So why a German shepherd? You know, I asked for a purse dog, so um, he oh was God. not, yeah, not what I had in mind. I really thought, wouldn't it be cute if I could take this little dog with me in my car, blah, blah, blah. Well, I live with three boys still at home and my husband, and so I was outvoted, and they said German Shepherd, and I thought, well, you know, I mean, yeah, okay, that'd be cool. I've never had one of those. I had no idea they were getting this old Rin Tin Tin style, old um, world German Shepherd and that he would be quite so big. But there he is. He's a very goofy boy. He's given us a lot of laughter. He's four years old. So um, Timber the German Shepherd. I was still trying to wrap my head around a 160 pound dog. That's I like know, right? Horse. Yeah, That's he crazy. is a small horse. Yeah. Yeah, ours, we don't tend to get um, what we call Heinz 57s from the sh local shelters. And so yes. ours tend to be like that 50 to 55 pounds. And that's quite big enough when we're on a walk. So I can only yeah. imagine being pulled by a German Shepherd that size. Thank goodness we live in the country. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you captured my attention when you said your next book is World War II. Because mm. I've been writing um, in the last year books back in the World War II time period. And sure. it's one of my favorites. But you write all over the place. So you're getting ready <laughs> to re-release a couple of my favorites. So Thank tell you. us about Eve and how mm. did you decide that you were going to write a book about the very first woman? Oh, uh, you know, I'm thinking way back. So this book is, is about 15 years old. It was my second book that I ever released. My first was Demon, a memoir. So the second book is Hava, the story of Eve. And when I was trying for years and years and years to get Demon released um, and trying to find an agent, trying to find a publisher, doing that whole thing, um, I somewhere along the line started writing what would become the prologue to this story. And it's it begins with a very, very old Eve toward the end of her life, preparing to tell her story um, as she experienced and lived it from her point of view. And so I wrote this one page. And when I finally sold the book that would become Demon, a memoir, which is not a memoir, it's a novel, really. And it's not scary. It sounds scary, but it's not. Um, when I finally sold that book and they said, what else do you have? I pulled this handwritten page out of my drawer and said, I've got this. And it became the prologue. They said, we'll take it. And then I had to go write that book. And so um, I had no idea what I'd gotten myself into, all the questions I would have to find some kind of an answer for and have to explore in the story. Um, it was definitely a journey, that story. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and when you're writing these books that are set with a well-known person, yeah, but someone who, I mean, like with Eve, the very first, her second person who was ever created, mm. there's 
some in the Bible, but then there's all this space. So how do you yeah. draw the lines and figure out, because when you're writing a novel that's 300, 350 pages about someone that there's three chapters, four chapters in the Bible on, how do yeah. you find that balance and wrestle yeah. with those questions that there really aren't necessarily answers for? Yeah, that's a really great question because there's only so much, as you say. And so it has to hit all the points in scripture. It has to hit all of the, the story points. But then there's a lot of other things that we know happen too. She had all these children. She had a, one son that killed another son. So there's all these other things that inform her story that, that I knew had to be part of her story that I had to touch upon. And then there's the aftermath of events like that, traumatic events like that. And also there's discovery as well because... Let's, I mean, imagine you wake up in paradise, right? What does that look like? And then at some point that paradise is lost. And what is that like? And what is your new life like? How is your relationship with your mate, this Adam? How is that changed as you're cast out of this, this perfect location and you have to start over in this now fallen world? What is that like? And so there's a lot of discovery that happens. Um, discovery relationally, discovery with raising children. I mean, how, what must that be like? I mean, you look at the animals around you and a deer gives birth and the baby deer gets up and runs off or, you know, whatever you give birth to a human baby and that thing doesn't get up and walk right away. So there's all these different things that, you know, were, were interesting to discover along the way in her journey, but also the points in the adjacent stories that would have informed hers as well. Um, you know, even Cain going off and discovering this land of Nod, even as he's wandering. How does that happen? What does that look like? What is that like for her as a mother? Um, so it became this this epic journey, actually. Um, and it it I overwrote that story. So as you said, a, a novel is about three hundred and some pages, but I overwrote that story by about sixty seven thousand words. And so the, yeah, so the initial draft was really, really long. And so it really was a journey of discovery for me through the events that we know about in her life and what might have gone in between. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how I, I do it. I, I go by what is there. I go by what I know of the history in this case, early history, invention of things like maybe weaving, pottery, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest is... You know, it has to be true to human nature. And that's how I, how I fill out my characters. That's amazing because that's something, that's a genre. I won't say I'll never write because as soon as I say that, God's going to be like, okay, that's your next book. <laughs> I, it's intimidating to me because like with World mm -hmm. War II, there's a lot of research, but it's not so distant. I can, it's mm -hmm. easy with movies and music and novels to be able to kind of place myself back in that time period. All you have for characters like Eve is Genesis. And then just like you said, knowing what we know about human nature, but then imagining what would it have been like before the fall? I mean, that's crazy to think about. And I hadn't yeah. even thought about how would you even know how to mother when there's no one to model that for you? Right. Yeah, exactly. How do you have a relationship? I mean, how do you know that if you eat this, you'll die when you've never seen death? I mean, how how do you yeah. reconcile these things in your own mind? And and so there were a lot of um, conundrums and things to think through in the writing of that book. Yeah, that's daunting. <laughs> <laughs> that it was daunting at the time. <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. did you do with those 67,000 words? Well, they're in a file somewhere. I do have one or two chapters that I salvaged, and I think that they are available on my website, actually, uh, as, as extras. But in this, this new re-release version, those, those are back in there. So um, I kind of snuck them back in. So. Yeah, so now the more complete edition <laughs> mm -hmm. that I'll be releasing. Right. Let's talk about Demon, because this was your first book. Yes. And before we started recording, we were even talking about the title, Demon and Memoir. Yeah. And yeah. I remember when it came out and I'd heard so much about it, but I was just, I couldn't get past the title. And yeah. then I had that tipping point person who was like, you've got to read it. And I still remember that book. And I guess it was 14 years ago when I would have read it. And it was just such a powerful, it's like a modern version of the screw tape letters, only very mm. different, but similar, mm. kind of like in that mm -hmm. vein of, what would it be like? How did you even come up with the idea <laughs> that I want to spend months or years writing in the head of a demon? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, you know, living in Nebraska at that time, I was living on the edge of town. And as you know, in Nebraska, our roads are very flat and very straight. And so you can kind of, your mind, your mind can wander really easily. And I remember I was driving and I, I was just thinking to myself, what would it be like to be, you know, a fallen angel? What, would, what must that be like? And then to see this creation of human beings come along and to know that they make mistake after mistake and that there's provision for them and God loves them, this, this race of clay, mud people and God has a special place in, in God's heart for these people and, and forgives them and does stuff that that are, is not recorded as being given to spiritual beings like angels. And what, what is that like? And what is it like when you're created before time even started, before the creation of the world? And then you watch this stuff play out, the creation of the world, the creation of humans, and you're you're a you're a witness to that. And what must that be like? And so um, it kind of became this fascination for me to, to write about this chronology of time before time up through history to the current moment um, from an outsider's point of view. And, and it really is, it is scary. The title's scary. It scared a lot of people off, unfortunately. Um, but it's the story of grace and it's the story of the Bible and it's the story of history. It's just told from an inverted point of view. So... <laughs> I think that's why I still remember it so vividly. It was that whole idea of what you were saying, you know, thinking about there are all these fallen angels or even angels themselves who could be sitting there and watching humans mm -hmm. me fail over and over again and going, what makes these mud people so special that they got a second chance when I didn't? And yeah. I don't know why, but that has just stayed with me so powerfully over all these years. It was such a reflection of the amazing grace that God extends to us that he didn't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he didn't extend it to them. And it does make you go, okay, why? why? Why did he choose to do that other than he's God and he can choose to do whatever he wants to? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. these are both books. They're some of your original books, your first two. Yeah. And they're coming back out so people mm -hmm. can, who may have missed them the first time, can experience them and wrestle with the questions that mm -hmm. you were asking and, and kind of uh, working through as you were writing yes. the book. And so you've also written one on Judas Iscariot, which that's another yeah. <laughs> Okay, like the villain of all villains. Right. You humanized him. Uh, you know, something happened to me when I was writing that book. First of all, I was terrified to write this book. I, I was really cowed by the research and the research and the history and, um, you know, just, uh, it seems like something you would spend the, a chunk of your life doing. And as fiction authors, you know, we can't always afford to spend a chunk of our life, you know, on a single book, but it felt like that kind of thing. And then something happened. Um, you know, I write in first person. So I go into books telling myself, you're a first century Jewish man, you're a first century Jewish man. But a third of the way in as this main character, this, this Judas Iscariot, as he is struggling with the agendas that he has for God in the way that God doesn't always act the way he thinks God should, I really realized that um, I was writing my own story. I'm writing a story of my own struggles against my own agendas for the way I believe God should act. And ultimately, that is not a book about Judas Iscariot. It's a book about this relationship with this enigmatic figure named Jesus Christ. And it's about their relationship and this larger image that Jesus had. And, um, and it's about his ministry. And so for me as an author, it was a chance to kind of lay that part of myself open, but also to go into this fictional setting and sit down at the side of Jesus Christ and, and wow. have him say to me, I've been waiting for you. Wow. That's really powerful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good and I overwrote that book too, <laughs> by a lot. <laughs> it sounds like as you're exploring all these really <laughs> deep issues, you do that, you know, because it becomes such a personalized journey that yeah. then you've got to go through the whole process and then go back down to yes. hear what really needs to be in the story for everyone else. Yes. And part of it's just that creative journey of you and God working through some really big issues and theological yeah. questions. Yeah, 
working through a lot of stuff. And then, yeah, at the end, then you pair away the other things. And, and for me, it was pairing away some of the, look at me, I did my research, you know, all that stuff, which you can still tell it's there, but you know, this is not a research paper. This is a story yeah. about relationships. So a lot of that stuff, the research was still there. I mean, I had to, I had to get a whole new shelf for my library for that book, but yeah. um, pared it back down to this relationship in the story. Because that's something when you're writing historical that is so important. We have to sprinkle in enough that people feel like they are dropped into that time period and that location. Yeah. But the challenge is not being over the top with, here's everything I learned that I think you should be equally fascinated with. Right, right. We do. We get the stack of books and we're like, here's everything. And I'm going to shove it all into my story. When yes. in reality, it's just that sprinkling of the pixie dust that trans yes. people. That's right. Exactly. So as you're moving into World War II, because this is a new time period for you. Oh, um, yeah, completely. What's, <laughs> what's been one of the most surprising things you've learned as you mm. kind of dove, dive, <laughs> have, have, have driven, <laughs> right? Um, but as you've jumped into this time period, what's been one of the things that's been most surprising or most challenging for you? So, you know, you, you mentioned how we have so many more resources um, for mm -hmm. historical research for a time period like World War II. I found that very intimidating <laughs> because it's all there and, you know, people remember this. And so, you know, you for me, I felt the pressure not to get it wrong for different reasons than I felt doing stuff set 2000 or even 3000 years ago or even before. So the research felt intimidating yet again for completely different reasons. Um, I loved it. It was very fascinating. It, um, it completely transported me. I think the thing that was um, probably the most surprising is uh, in this book, it's called The Long March Home. It's the story of three uh, teenage best friends who enlist and they're serving in the Philippines at the mm -hmm. time that uh, Pearl Harbor is bombed. And so the Philippines was plunged immediately into war right after that. And I had never heard of or been familiar with the Batam Death March. And so to yeah. learn about that chapter in history, which is so central to the story, uh, these three best friends, they're marched um, when when the Americans end up having to surrender, they're marched 60 miles without food, water, all this stuff. Uh, it's a it's a really um, a very difficult chapter in history. And so learning about that and learning, you know, just looking back and thinking, I, I can't believe anyone survived that. And then the subsequent years of life as a POW, uh, it doesn't seem like anybody should be able to survive that. And yet people did. And it, it's a true testament um, it's a, it's a true testament to the power of friendship in many cases, because the, the survivors have relationships that help sustain them, um, and to, to faith and um, to many things. But I, I wasn't aware of this chapter in history. So it, it was definitely an education for me. Uh, and it's definitely an honor to be able to share that story with uh, readers who may also have not been familiar with it as well. Yeah, I was um, telling students on Friday, I was, teach was co-teaching or guest teaching at a literature class, and I said, I very intentionally, when I write World War II, do home front stories. So I've got three from Nebraska, but then also Europe, because the Pacific was just so much more brutal, and war is mm. brutal, but there was just a difference because of kind of the kamikaze mindset and mm -hmm. some of that that was brought into it mm -hmm. uh, and the value for human life is just a little different not that it was mm -hmm. great on the European side either but there's just yeah. a brutality that makes it hard to you know as an author put myself in that mindset and go I'm gonna live here so my hat's off to you because yeah. that <laughs> would be a very hard place to yeah. spend months writing a book and doing the research yeah. to get it right and to honor the experience of those who did live it and did have to actually mm -hmm. walk those roads and survive those years. Yeah, it was a very tough space to be in for sure. And and 
that's there's a reason why that is the reason why we interspersed several chapters about the boys growing up and their antics as children and yeah. you know what brought them together and bonded them together and we interspersed those through the current timeline of them being in the war and being in the the prisoner camps in order to just kind of alleviate some of that for the reader along the way yeah giving those the readers the chance to breathe to go okay. yeah yeah, there's something there's something joy filled. There's something normal, and then you can dive right back yeah. in. Yeah, that kind of is a great segue to what's your writing process like when you're in the middle of a book. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, some people write first thing in the morning. Others write all day. Some write on weekends. So what's your kind of process look like? Yeah, so. I, I really um, envy people who have good discipline and routines because I've never had either. Uh, I, I work very hard at certain things and I, I used to be a ballet dancer and I work, worked very hard at that and I was very disciplined in that way. But when it comes to like making myself sit down and work on something, um, I, I don't map that out throughout the day. I know I need to get something done. And so the best way for me that I found through the years and people generally don't change that much, you know, as they get older, right. Um, is I, I don't multitask well, so I can do pretty much one thing well at a time. So I'll go in and I'll write and I'll write, 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 and I'll do long days and, and then I'll get up and do it again the next day. And I'll, I'll put the same clothes I had on the day before, whatever's on the floor next to my bed. And I go back up and I just go back into it. And that's that's the process that has worked for me. If I have something going on with my husband or kids or whatnot, then you know I'll go do that and then I'll come back. I try not to take a really long hiatus from the manuscript or the computer because then I, I lose track mm -hmm. and it takes that much longer to get back into it. Um, and so I kind of do it obsessively, but that seems to work well for my personality, at least. I don't yeah. recommend it for everybody because it really depends on what works for you. But through the years, that's what's worked for me. And I will say, I used to work a lot through the night until the wee hours or even until dawn. But after getting married and, and acquiring kids and then turning 50, I don't do that as much anymore. <laughs> I just, it doesn't work for me the same. So there are different seasons and kids have different times that they need you. And mm -hmm. I remember on social media, you used to do the Tosca cam. Oh and yeah. <laughs> like that where every day it would be like, okay, I'm on deadline. And it's <laughs> because it was nine hours of writing and I've had to learn, like right now I'm in a season where it's all about 20 minute sprints and I can get seven or 800 really good words done in 20 minutes. If I've done my research I'm in the story and it's how many of those can I squeeze in around other things. And so I've even mm -hmm. changed how I write. I've got my books when I'm drafting them are online on a program so that if I've got 20 minutes here, I can grab it. Or if I've 20 minutes at home, it doesn't matter where I am the book's all there, the research is all there, it's waiting for me, and I can just get in and go head down. I love that, that's smart. Yeah, yeah. but it's it's not the way it's always been, you know, and I've just had mm -hmm. to learn, it has to flex, because mm -hmm. like you said, seasons change, and family demands shift, so, mm -hmm. okay, so we've only got a couple more minutes left, so I want to talk just a little bit, you do a lot of teaching writing, so you're an excellent writer. Your books are phenomenal. Thank They're you. like workshops in themselves on how oh, to create story you. and immersive worlds and all of that. I love them. But you also teach writing. So one of the classes you've been teaching lately is all about how to add layers to characters. Mm -hmm. And you have kind of a different approach to it. So I thought it'd be kind of fun for readers and other writers to hear a little bit about your process. So in a few minutes, mm -hmm. kind of tease them on what your approach to building these characters is? Mm. So characterization is one of my favorite things. Um, and, you know, I remember my oldest son said to me once when I was writing the this book about the Queen of Sheba, and I said, you know, she's met Solomon now. And he's like, no, Solomon, was he a good guy or a bad guy? And I said, he was both. Oh. Yeah. And everybody is both. And everybody is a dichotomy. And so I love getting to the point in a manuscript when a character is having to do things they would never have contemplated doing before. Um, Donald Moss writes about this in his book, Writing the, the Breakout Novel, where there comes a point where your character should say, 
or do the thing that they never would have thought about doing before. And I, I love finding those, those, those pivots. And I love finding those, um, those little trap doors in people because people are not two dimensional. Um, mm -hmm. They are not just good or bad. Um, and I, I love too tapping. I, I'm a big believer in tapping into our own hopes, dreams, hurts, wounds, whatever it is. And even though the situation may be different for the characters, I love tapping into the same emotions of what it is and transferring that into the writing. And so that's something that that I do a lot when I teach on characterization specifically. Yeah, and it's, I think it's the part that pushes us to go deeper. So I've been taking a note over here is because I'm in the middle of editing one novella that feeds right into the novel I'm writing. And I'm like, okay, what's that thing that they never would have done that they do? And because we hear it, but the actual layering it in is the challenge and it's yeah. hard to do and it's yeah. one place where as writers we can kind of slack off and take the easy route but that's not what our characters need or what readers right. deserve right. and so you know and there are people like you and Susie Warren who do such a good job of pushing us to always go deeper and do that hard work it makes us all better so mm. I yeah. think that's a big part of the journey big part of the journey is to go that deep into it so. Yeah, and that figuring out and spending the time with the character. Um, and I've learned, that's one of the things I think I've learned probably in book 32 through where I am right now is taking the time up front on the characters mm. because I often have an idea of the plot, but I'll get a few chapters and I'll be like, I thought I knew the character and I don't. I don't have enough of the dimensions. And so mm. taking that time up front that feels like wasted time because I'm not producing words but then the words that are written are just richer and deeper and there's more to the story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's, it's hard. That's the part that <laughs> be like, I just got to get going. I got to get producing. I've got to do something. Right. Um, right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And it's so great to hear that some of these original stories that are so exceptional, Eve and Demon or Hava, the story of Eve and Demon and Memoir are coming back out Yay! as well as in your World War II story, which is going to have an amazing pre-order special as well. Oh, so. that's right. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's, I'm so excited for this. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so everybody check the show notes because that's where all the details are going to be. But thank you so much for joining me. It's been so great to see you. Absolutely. You thank out. you so much for having me. And I'm just so happy for this time to chat together too.